The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. What project are we working on this week, Ben? Well, we're going to continue the Logic Gate board game. Oh, cool. OK, so what's the next step? Well, um, I think what we should do, we, we should kind of hit it from multiple ends. Mm -hmm. You know how you have your magnetic things that you want to use, yeah. at least for testing purposes? I still think they're a little too large, but that doesn't mean we can't prototype with them. OK, so I can solder some wires onto those magnet ends. But I was thinking you could work on that, and then Felix and I could work on the screen solution. Remember how we talked about having the screen? Yeah. So I, I've been doing some research since the last episode, and um, it turns out with a PIC32 microcontroller, mm -hmm. there's a way you can use that to direct to drive a TFT LCD screen without an external controller chip. Well, technically, the LCD screen has a controller chip on it, but basically, you could go right from the microcontroller to the screen. We have enough PIC32s laying around and enough LCD screens that we might be able to find some that match. There's an issue with how much RAM we have available, but I think we could at least see if we can get that to work, because then that could be a really easy solution solution for the final product. I mean, it would require very few parts. Sounds like a plan. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Okay, so I'm going to measure all of the components, the screen, try to get eight ports on both sides of the screen, and then eight along the top, four for the source and four for the results, uh, and then leave room for LEDs for all of that at the top. Get a design that hopefully fits as small as possible, and then laser cut a prototype, assemble it all, wire it up, and hopefully prove that it'll work, because otherwise then it'll be back to the drawing board. Looks like so far, my laser cut prototype is working. It's working. I'm just using these blue LEDs because they're the only 10, 10 millimeter LEDs I found that actually have pigment to them because I didn't want to mix up like red and green and have to plug them in to figure out what color they are to put them away in their bin when we don't use them. But it looks like they fit pretty good. Yeah. So finish putting these in and I can hand them over to you. I'm gonna wire it up or do whatever yeah, you're gonna yeah, do with okay. it. Okay. I'm pretty much just gonna put wires on there and maybe some headers. Cool. Hey, so I um, added some sides to this uh, face piece that we made here. So just to give the project a little bit more structure. And now what I'm gonna do is uh, hot glue in these light emitting diodes. I might get, I think I'm gonna get uh, some more LEDs to put over here as well. And then um, I'm gonna solder some wires and uh, put some leads onto these buttons. So that's what I'm gonna work on. All right, so we've got our prototype onto this cardboard here. We've got our uh, connectors. These are gonna be our inputs. These are gonna be our outputs. We have our source here and our result. I've also added some light emitting diodes. They're all glued in there. We put the button clasp on here on the other side. I soldered some leads onto them. And at the end of the leads, I've uh, put some headers. And you can see in here where I put the light emitting diodes. And then on each of them, I added a resistor and a NPN transistor so that we can supply five volts to the LEDs and then trigger them with a three 0.3 volt logic or whatever the other logic might be. Yeah, so I'm just gonna demonstrate how the lights work. I mean, it's not a big deal, but I'll show you what it, what it does now. Let me give it some five volts here. And then I've also got this little three volt battery pack. All right, here's our three volts and we're gonna trigger the source lights. Let's see here. Okay, that one works. Okay, that one works. This one. Okay, those light up. What about these? Okay, and here is our result. Okay, those work. And then finally, these LEDs are working as well. Okay, so that's cool. Um, next, I'm gonna hand this off to Mr. Heckendorn and uh, maybe he'll connect it to the microcontroller. 
For those of you that have followed The Ben Hex Show over the last year, you might remember that I used to work for a company called The Game Crafter. So I invited my friend JT here, who is one of the proprietors of The Game Crafter, to gain his expertise in the area. JT, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you are qualified to help us with this game here. Well, I own a game company called The Game Crafter, where we manufacture thousands of games every year. I go to dozens of conventions every year specifically about game design. I've designed lots of games, including some best-selling games like The Captain is Dead. Uh, and I've just generally been in the industry playing games for 20 plus years. So I think I have a little bit of experience. So give me an example of a puzzle. So, um, like phase, what's your level yeah. one puzzle? Yeah, so so the phase one or level one puzzle would just use one of these gates. Okay. Two main elements that are missing is uh, there's the difficulty level indicator, mm -hmm. which will either be on a series of LEDs that are labeled or it will be on the screen and it should remain on the screen the whole time so that you know if you're on whichever level difficulty you're on. And there will be a selector button so that you can select your difficulty. And does um, it auto scale as you complete one puzzle? It does not. Okay. Um, because what we're going to do is design, you know, a minimum of 10 to 20 puzzles per difficulty level. And so that way, even if you solve that one, maybe you don't quite have it down. Down, it's up to you to decide, okay, I keep solving these, now they're super easy, time to move it up a level. Or okay. like, I kind of got this, but I want it to be more difficult, so. So you want to keep it more education, less yes. game. One thing I'm hearing that you, mm -hmm. you're you like, you want to make this into a product. Right. Right. So what you got for me? First, I mean, forget the electronics for a minute. Uh -huh. Making an educational game uh, to be something that is marketable. Mm -hmm. It's tough. That is the hardest type of game to yeah. make, right? Yep, Because sure you need is. to not only make it educational, but you need to make it fun. Yep. If it's not fun, no one's playing it. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you've got, you're an uphill battle before we even get to the electronics. Yep. That's why we brought you in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bringing in the experts from the beginning. I'm not a magician. So. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, board games are very social. Right. Video games are kind right. of antisocial. Right. They're mostly single player. Mm -hmm. So is this going to, do you want it to be more single player or do you want it to be? For now, we're saying single player. Okay. Um, just because if we try to, factor in like too many things at once, it's gonna be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So if it's a single player game, you need tension to be created by the game. If it's a multiplayer game, the tension is created by your opponents. Okay. Um, so since we're talking single player, mm -hmm. uh, we gotta come up with a tension element. You didn't like the timer. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe we just need to refine that. Because yeah. the problem we were having before was that, like I said, people were just panicking and going, ah. All right, so building a game you, you know, ultimately, the most important factor in any game is fun, right? Right. But how do you measure fun? It's impossible. Right. I mean, yeah, you can. I think the cl uh, the closest thing we have to a measurement of fun is probably like a barrel of monkeys. But I don't know where you go with that. So really, how you measure fun is through engagement. Mm -hmm. Okay. It could be a matter of how many puzzles have you done, regardless of success or failure. Educational games and simulations are very similar in this regard. You, mm -hmm. the further you get toward fun the further away you are from your source material, generally Usually, speaking. Yeah. I've helped people, for example, there was a guy building a horse racing game. He really loves going and gambling on horse racing. So he built this amazing game. It's a huge board and it's, uh, and it it's right really down. really realistic, but super expensive in a crappy game. Yeah, <laughs> the statistics on it are absolutely simulate a real horse race, yep. right? But it takes two hours to play and it is not at all fun. And so that's the thing you need to yeah. take into account with figure this. figure out where to compromise. Exactly. Yep. Well, thank you very much for all of your advice. We will probably be calling you on you again later into the builds and say, all right, we've got a cool thing. You want to come play test it for us and tell us how wrong we are? I would love to break it. So Yay! I'll be happy to come back. All right. Well, look, we will look forward to that day. All right. So this is the same screen we used on like the Atari Portable and I think we're going to use this on the N64 as well. Yeah, and the thing that was neat about it is the manufacturer was kind enough to put test pins for every signal on the back of it and they were even, even labeled. <laughs> so I, I pinned it all out and then I removed the driver chip just so you know we could take control of the screen. So that way we don't have to find a connector for this. But the challenge with this screen is its resolution is too high okay. for the RAM built into this microcontroller. Mm -hmm. So this is a PIC32 MX795F512L, which I am intimately familiar with. Okay, so this is pretty good. This one can drive an LCD. However, it doesn't have enough internal RAM for this size screen, but it could do this 320 by 240 Adafruit screen. 
However, we don't have a handy dandy breakout for it. So that's what Felix and I are working on is making a breakout. And this, this is the uh, old school starter kit expansion board. And there should be enough uh, connections on this to actually drive the screen. Now I did also get this. This is the new PIC32. This is the MZ series. It's a lot faster. It's like 200 megahertz up to 252 megahertz. It has four times the RAM, four times the program space. It's basically a PIC32 on steroids. This one would definitely have enough internal RAM to drive a screen of this size, if not larger. Or you could drive a screen this size with a frame buffer. However, the connection on the bottom is different. Oh no. And I was looking online and I can't really Really find a lot of boards to plug this into, which is kind of strange. So that's kind of our challenge. There is a header here, but it doesn't really have anything useful on it. I guess what you do with this, you use DMA, direct memory access, and that basically can move memory around without using the CPU. So when you have a line of video, you set up a DMA event and it just clocks out the data and it uses the right strobe as a dot clock to like pulse the dot clock on the LCD. And then you set up an interrupt to do the um, front and back porch for each line. So really it only uses CPU time at the end or beginning of a line. Because remember when we used the FPGA to drive an LCD? An FPGA could do this with no problem, but FPGA is really expensive. So if we can get a microcontroller to drive a screen like this, obviously we need a slightly larger screen. I mean, maybe we can get like 500 by 700 LCD, but I just want to see if it's possible first. So like, I think our goal this week should be to get a PIC32 to drive an LCD. So what Felix and I are doing is we are going to make a breakout board for this Adafruit screen because Felix has 94 metric tons of the Adafruit screens. This is like the worst drawn schematic ever. Ta-da! <laughs> Well, there you go. I did it with only 15 pins. Switch three points. Because we can't do 18-bit color with the amount of RAM we have. But we'll just use three bits per color. Cool. Okay, so I'm adding these switches here. This is going to be mode select. There's four bits that you can use to like set how this LCD is accessed. And I'm just putting like pull up resistors and a dip switch bank so I can set this manually myself without having to worry about doing it with a microcontroller. There's several modes for this LCD in the Raspberry Pi. It's uh, serial and we want parallel RGB. That's one difference. Okay, so my plan is to get this, you know, basically put a bunch of pins on this so we can use it for prototyping. Let's make sure it still works or still inserts. Yeah, there we go. Like a glove. The LED backlight is labeled anode and cathode. And one thing I did wrong versus the Adafruit screen, the Adafruit screen had four parallel resistors going into the backlight. I forgot to do that. So I'm just gonna add a larger resistor on the cathode side, which is the negative side of the LED backlight. Let's see if it turns on the light. <laughs> okay, so the backlight works. All right, this shows what kind of connection I wanna use. I'm gonna use 18-bit bus interface. So it's 0, 0, 1, 1. All right. I'm gonna hook up a power and ground connection and then I'm gonna hook up a bunch of data connections and then uh, we can try hooking this up to a display of some kind. Maybe something will happen. Maybe, mostly. Okay, so this is the microchip starter dev board. Now this only works with the older microchip units that have less RAM. That's why I'm gonna use a smaller screen. So I'm gonna wire directly up to the LCD pinout here. I just have to uh, do it right. So let's see. DMA, uh, DB0, so we went up from 15. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, those are the bits. Wait a minute, I only have eight bits. Well, I'll just not hook one of them up. I don't care, as long as I get a picture, I'll be happy. One, two, three, four, tell me that you sloth me more. Oh, yeah, oh, sloths are cool. <laughs> Okay, so I was doing some research about direct driving raw glass. Well, I mean, it's not completely raw. There is a controller on the glass itself. So this piece I reverse engineered over the weekend using the oscilloscope and I figured out what all the timing signals were, like the dot clock, front and back porch, V-Sync, H-Sync, all of that. I wrote it all down. So what I'm gonna do is I'm not quite to the point where I can do it with a microcontroller yet because I have a few challenges. 
with that. I have one microcontroller that doesn't have enough of a breakout board. Another microcontroller doesn't have enough RAM. But I realized what I could do in the meantime is try to get it running with an FPGA, which I do have laying around. Now an FPGA would be way too expensive for this project. However, I'm using it here as a proof of concept. So I'm gonna go into Quartus and uh, start a new project. I have no files to add. Okay, this is a Cyclone 4. I don't think it's a GX though. I think it's a Cyclone Floor E. Oh, here we go. EP4CE22F17C6. Cool. So one thing that I reverse engineered with the screen is that it has a dot clock of 11 megahertz. So I'm gonna create a clock using the mega function wizard. And even when we drive this with a uh, microcontroller, the uh, dot clock is still gonna be the most important thing. Yeah, I'm gonna create a new thing. Eh, let's see, we'll call it a pixel clock. Yay, all right, uh, what's the input crystal on this? I wanna say it's 50 megahertz, yes, okay. So we're basically gonna say, hey, we need, a, we need this uh, FPJ to do 11 megahertz. So we're gonna say, okay, we've got a 50 megahertz crystal, which is what this dev board has. Blah, 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 uh, I don't think blah, blah, blah. I just want one thing, please. Oh, finally, all right, enter output frequency. Okay, we want 11 out. So what it does is it multiplies 50 by 11 and then divides it by 50 and that gives us 11 megahertz. Then, uh Now, microcontrollers do that as well on the inside. That's how they get their multiple speeds because they might have a, you know, they might have like an eight megahertz crystal and that's multiplied by 10. Well, actually, no, it, it's not, it's usually multiplied by, uh, it'd be divided by four and then multiplied by eight, but then they could also divide and multiply that again to create other clock frequencies like for real-time clock, although that might have its own oscillator, USB, because usually that runs at a set frequency. But anyway, in this case, we want 11 megahertz. All right, so I'm gonna create this clock and then I can write some code around it, which is gonna be way more boring than you'll possibly wanna see. A couple of conventions ago, I honestly don't remember which, someone gave me this electronic greeting card and they're like, hey, uh, don't be freaked out if you turn it on because they'd use it to propose to their wife and it said, will you marry me? And I'm like, oh, okay. So he's like, well, I thought you could use it. And we had this laying around and then I, I noticed the screen looked pretty uh, close to the one that we were using with our experiment. So I ripped the screen out of this and I hooked up an example and it turns out, yeah, it is the same pinout. So now I have two screens. This is the original screen hooked up to the FPGA board. And this is the one from the electronic greeting card hooked up to one of the original NTSC driver boards. So the reason I did this was so I could uh, compare them in great detail on the scope. And I think I might have found out what I was doing wrong. Okay, so on the screen here, this is the NTSC driver board that works. And here's the uh, horizontal sync pulses, see them? Right there, here's the vertical sync pulse. And see how the vertical sync pulse or the you know the vertical sync line starts at the beginning of the horizontal sync pulse. And here's what I've been doing. See how I have the vertical sync line happening after the pulse? So I think the difference is they're basically, they're switching the line at the beginning of the pulse and I'm switching at the end of the pulse. Uh, yeah, so maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. So I'm gonna adjust my code and see if this makes a difference because I've double checked everything else. I've double checked the timing, the counts, the pulse width, the duty cycle. I can't think of anything else. I'm going crazy. Err. Okay, I finally got the screen to show something. Right now it's just playing a lovely puke brown, but if we change a few parameters, we can make it other colors. I don't have the full RGB hooked up, just uh, green and, and red. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Recompile. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Who do we appreciate? All right, so there's a, a red screen. It's not super bright, but it is there. Now let's see if we can do, get it to do a gradient. I'm gonna make RGB equals V count, and that might change the brightness per line. I mean, I don't have this doing any raster effects. I'm basically just trying to figure out the timing because if I know the timing works with the FPJ and double check it with an oscilloscope, then when I write the interrupt based DMA control using the microcontroller, I'll at least have the right numbers to start with. I don't know why it's dim, but yeah, can you see the gradient going That's vertically? Better. That's a win! Ben, I think we made some really good progress this week and I'm excited about our eureka moment of we should use an LCD instead of all of those just like diagrams and yeah. gates. Yeah, you and Felix did a good job of mocking up how we could put magnetic contacts around the screen. I think we should try to get the contacts a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really common size of screen. We discovered a 480 by 272. 272. Right? Also, uh, you can get a touch screen controller for this. It's crappy resistive touch, but it's also cheap. So we did some tests. I 
reverse engineered the signals going to this screen so I could get the timing off of it. And then I reprogrammed that using FPGA, figure out how to drive this. And then in the future, I want to drive it with a microcontroller. And then we can also use that microcontroller to do all the logic. And um, then we also talked to your friend JT. Yeah, I'm really excited about all of the feedback we got from JT. I think it's going to send us in the right direction and get us really thinking about how to make this a product that would actually be marketable and fun to play. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you have any comments or questions about our Logic Gate board game build, let us know on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. <laughs> As I laid these out, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Northern California where the girls are warm and I don't remember the rest of the lyrics. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really like to bug people who are mar marginally agitated. I don't even like bothering people who aren't agitated. Why didn't anybody tell me I got stuff all over my shirt? I wasn't looking that close Well, it's because I want to embarrass you, Felix. I've been focusing on this project. Blame me on the rain. What is your reason for divorce? My wife failed to disclose to me that she was a sloth. And then when I found out she was a sloth, I promptly told her, that is illegal, we are getting a divorce. That's right. That's why she wanted to take things slow. I always wondered why hair covered her entire body. Always struck me as odd. You know what would be interesting about an afterlife? It's like if you could ask questions like, how much time did I spend in my life waiting for things to compile? And then like the aliens or God or whatever would be like, you spent 3,484 hours. And like, no! Hey, do you think when they pitched that movie Paycheck about the reverse engineer action hero, the executives were like, why would anyone want to watch a movie about trains going backwards? It's like trying to buy liquor. Yeah, I'm 21, yeah. yeah. Hello, I am 21. Here is my ID. We are warehouse workers. Need proof? The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.